Oh, look, we've already got a comment. Before we even start, I'm going to post this comment right here. I'm here just to harass my <laughs> old friend, Martine. From hey, Lieberman. Joe, nice to see you again. <laughs> that's, that's a way to start a conference is by harassing somebody. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. We are back. At, for and This is uh, we're with Martine, Mar uh, Martine Spans. Did I say it right? Yes. Wow, I did right. good. Uh, we She's talking about the 10 rules for business and mobile games. And then... We'll have a bonus AMA afterwards where you can ask ask her anything. I will go ahead. Did you want to say anything, Jay? Or I'm good. I He's just, good. Okay. I'm not He's worried. Like, team, I don't even know why I'm here, here, he says. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I will leave it to you, and you can do your presentation and talk about whatever you would like. All right. Great. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. And, uh, yeah, as Indy also said, already said, uh, I'm going to do a short introduction 10 rules for free-to-play game design, basically. Um, and first, I'm gonna like, give you a little bit of an intro about me, who, you know, for those who don't know me. Uh, apparently, there are people listening who do. Um, yeah, my name is Martin Spans. I've been in the industry for uh, more than 10 years, uh, always focused on sort of the commercial side of the business, uh, on the publishing side. Um, for um, seven or eight years now, I've been running my own uh, my own uh, game publishing label, Tamalaki. And we're heavily focused on hidden objects, match tree, time management, and uh, all kinds of games that are typically played by women over 40. Um, and in those years, we've released more than 100 of those titles. Um, and we don't do that alone. We do that with our partner company, FGL. Um, and they focus a little bit more on also on the casual side of things, but more like a 50-50 male-female splits uh, for their games, uh, and I'm helping them with the business development. Um, so to give you a, a little bit of an idea of the type of games we work with, I have a little video here. Now let's cross fingers and hope it works. Martin, you may want to turn the sound down on the game. Okay, yeah. Well, the video is, is finished now. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, was, was it annoying, the sound? No, it was just it was hard to hear you. Well, I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so that was just a little bit of a, an intro uh, of the type of games that we do. And this was our hit game, Home Desire Blast. Most of the stats that I'm going to present here are from Home Designer Blast. Um, and uh, yeah, basically based on what we learned from uh, publishing those type of games, I kind of set up 10 simple rules. Um, by no means kind of, you know, very, very exclusive rules, but just interesting things to keep in mind when you are designing a free-to-play game and when you're aiming for some commercial uh, uh, success. So rule number one. Um, retention is uh, actually like our most important metric, uh, the one we focus on before we focus on anything else, before we even focus on monetization. Um, and then especially sort of the first few days, like that day one to day seven um, is, is extremely important because that's where, well, as, as most of you will know, you will lose 90% of your players, uh, probably even more. Um, so for example, for Home Designer Blast, here are two situations um, where we, um, yeah, so this is like two set of sets of stats with, I think we had three weeks in between these two, uh, where we just constantly like tweak the game, the level difficulty, the, um, uh, the dialogues, uh, just placement of the buttons, uh, where people need to click, how many clicks, um, all tiny tweaks like that. Um, and as you can see here, the day one only actually went up with 0.8%. Uh, Doesn't really sound like much, but if you already look at the day seven, that already led to a 1.6% uh, better day seven. So kind of that small gap basically only grows, grows bigger uh, as you further go into, into the, the retention funnel. So these tiny tweaks uh, do matter later on. Um, Kind of leading into 
point two, um, day 30 retention. That is of all the retention points, kind of the one that we pick as the most important one to sort of gauge uh, success, where we always do kind of aim for a day 30 retention of um, uh, about 4%, uh, ideally more, of course. Um, and um, most people who do turn into spenders already do so within those first 30 days. Um, I know with some mid-core hardcore games, it's that's like a lot shorter. The conversion already happens in like three days or something. Our casual players um, need a little bit longer to to kind of be fully convinced uh, that this game uh, earns a, uh, deserves a little bit of their money. Um, so that the yeah, the day 30 is kind of really the the one that we uh, heavily focus on. Um, and not just for the spenders, but also for the ad revenue. Because um, in those 30 days, there will also be a lot of ads that people watch, and that does reflect in, uh, in, in your monetization. So here, for example, are the monetization stats of the day 7 and the day 30 uh, split up per country. Now, in the United States, there are quite a bit of, uh, of spenders in the game. Um, but even uh, countries where there's not a lot of spenders in the game, for example, like uh, Brazil, uh, uh, Russian Federation, Turkey, uh, even when you look at those countries, you see that the, uh, the average revenue per user actually does go up significantly by just keeping them in the game and just from the fact that they watch a lot of video ads. Um, and we'll, I'll be going into the design of video ads uh, also a little bit later in, into this presentation. Um, interesting thing that I also want to mention is that we don't kind of stop after day 30 for paying attention. Um, there's another game that we have live currently, it's called Roomfall, and it's like a match tree medieval adventure game um, with a huge long tail because there we even see a day 90 retention of 4%. Um, so yeah, it's, it's absolutely vital to kind of be, be, be tweaking the funnel because um, you know we, are, we obviously want to keep as many players in the game as long as possible. Um, before I go into the um, ads part, I'll first go a little bit more into the uh, in-app purchase design. Um, again, here are some stats from Home Designer Blast. Um, where obviously the most popular uh, in-app purchase pack is the cheapest one, the treasure chest uh, that's priced at $2.99. Um, but the point here, it kind of is, is that kind of the six people who bought the superstar designer pack, they brought in uh, roughly as much as as you know two hundred of the people who who bought the uh, the, the treasure chest, the, the cheapest pack. So, but you know, if we had not um, given them the option of buying an expensive pack of a hundred dollars, then uh, the pack under that, sort of the the, the second most expensive one, is uh, fifty dollars. Um, you know, and, and then they would have gone for that. And then the, uh, to make people repeat a purchase is a lot sort of harder, you know, it takes a lot more convincing than just that one single purchase. So you could say like, oh, my most expensive pack is $50. People can buy it over and over again. But then either, every time you need to convince the user again and again to then purchase that pack again. Well, as if you have this great offer for four hundred dollars with so many extras, and you know, like um, basically sixty percent of the gem price off compared to the cheaper packs, etc., make it really interesting that way. Um, yeah, there's you know, the the chances of people actually like spending a little bit more money in your game uh, increases significantly. Um, yeah, and you know, be sure to to vary your uh, your, your inner purchase offers um, and make them visually as interesting as you can. Um, whereas, I mean, when you look at these screenshots, um, of course, the the you know one again is from Home Designer Blast. Um, it kind of looks like this big um, list, sort of a big shopping list of all the stuff that you get when you purchase one of these packs. Um, there's you know a, a wide use of, of of color to make it sort of look visually attracting, and there's this long list of like all the stuff that you're getting. And at the bottom, you see these little purple P uh, signs that's like prestige points. It's kind of like a loyalty scheme, also that people kind of save up points for, and they get more when they purchase more. And 
basically just a load of tricks that you see in, in retail, um, you know, with every store offering their own little loyalty scheme. We were like, well, we might as well also kind of try that out and do that in our game and see if that works. Um, and I mean, I'm, you know, stuff like the loyalty perks, it's not something that is um, sort of really the, the big decision maker for people if they are gonna purchase a bigger pack or not. But it is kind of more like an added bonus on top of what they're already getting. Um, so it just that contributes to the, the feel good factor. Um, and then yeah, also to kind of mix in um, a, a little bit of a screenshot of a different game. I also added one here of um, uh, Idle Binder Tycoon. Um, and there you will kind of see strategically they are putting the uh, most expensive pack on top. So that will be the first one that you see. And what's interesting about this, that little note, I hope it's not too small to read, um, but it says in stock. So the top one, there's one in stock, and then the middle one, three, and the bottom one, there's five. So they're kind of limiting how many times the user can purchase these packs. And of course, like the most expensive one, you can only buy it once. Kind of adding that feel of, of exclusivity. Um, and then of course there's the timer that these offers are only available for five days, 19 hours and 45 minutes. So uh, it's only available for a limited time, uh, which also kind of adds that extra sort of um, exclusive feeling to these offers where the player you know, might feel like they cannot miss out on this. Um, a little bit enough about you know purchases. Um, live ops is of course also just to try to keep your game, um, you know, to have your game feeling fresh all the time. Um, and of course, you do that with updates, but you don't want your updates to be far too labor intensive. Like you don't want to specifically design a whole new level pack for every you know biweekly update that you that you do. So. When you're already, you know, we haven't released your game yet. You know, it's really important to, at that stage, already think about um, how to sort of design uh, your your updates when you are live. Um, a few things that we did was, uh, you know, a level of the day, something that is just open to everyone who, no matter where they are in the game, if they're just starting out or if they're like level five thousand, there's always a level of the day available. Um, you know, and uh, beat the level in, in three or less tries and uh, get an extra coin prize, you know, things like that. So just even when, when there's, you know, when people already um, finished all the levels there are, that there's always something, something fresh to log in for every day. Um, and else players will always run out of your content way, way, way faster than you think. Um, per two weeks, we release about six, between 60 and 75 new levels to the game. And there's always people who finish those in like one or two days. Um, even though, you know, these levels are, you know, it's, it's, it, I think right now we're, with the game, we're at level 5,000 something. There's, there's definitely not a lack of content in the game. Um, but, you know, people just like wheel through it when, when they're really into it. Uh, so it's like you, you will never, that's why I'll add it to, to the line here, you will never have enough content. Even when you think like, well, this will surely keep people interested for like a month, they will probably finish it in a few days. Um, so, yeah, um, kind of more creative ways that we also implemented to um, Kind of, you know, keep people engaged and keep them keep them busy is a uh, design contest. Um, Home Designer Blast is of course not only about sort of the block blasting the core gameplay, but also the meta gameplay of designing rooms. Um, and uh, well, the core sort of the, the the story is that you you design rooms for the clients, so it's just a um, sort of in-game character interaction. Uh, but next to that, we also have sort of this dream home design uh, module, and that is just like a free space where you can put in anything. You know, can, you can um, uh, flip your furniture, make it bigger or, or, or smaller, put it, you know, um, move it front and back. And placement doesn't have so uh, furniture doesn't have this um, set placement, but you're kind of free to to design it that way. Um, and then a contest uh, that runs also every two weeks. Um, and the contests always have like a theme to it. The last one that we ran had a hotel at home theme. Um, this, this screenshot here, this example, the Scandinavian design event. 
So just like to give people some of a, a direction of what kind of room they should design um, and uh, then kind of enter in, into the contest. Um, and then there's there's voting rounds also to um, you know let people sort of see each other's uh, design and, and engage that way. So this was also added to give people who do not necessarily have that drive to immediately blast their way to level five thousand to give them sort of more more something to play around with and more something to do. Because we've definitely noticed that there there are people who enjoy the core gameplay. And there are people who see the core gameplay as a grind to get to the meta gameplay of, of the home decoration. So just to kind of give po both players um, something to do. Um, this is a kind of a, a little bit more about, about the same points to update often and stay active. Um, as I said, we release new level packs every two weeks, but we ideally update the game every week, uh, even, if though if, even if it's with something small, just to kind of show the users that we're always on top of it, always active, always adding new stuff. Um, and there's always weekly events running, so like uh, tournaments, um, and of course there's like a bunch of special events that uh, I mean, you know, that, that whole sort of cycle starts up in October with Halloween and then Thanksgiving and Christmas and winter and Valentine, etc. Um, so that's, yeah, just to kind of yeah, have people engage in, in seasonal content as well. Because um, we also definitely noticed that seasonal content, no matter how incredibly cheesy it might be, um, it, it's definitely, you know, it has higher engagement rates than the usual content. So even though sometimes you have the feeling that you get sick of Christmas because absolutely every every company does something about Christmas, it it, subs, it still sells. Um, and also throwing in a, a screenshot of a different game um, here is a, a screenshot of Clash Royale. Also like jumping in on the uh, the, the holiday season, uh, you know, the holiday theme. Um, and what is interesting here is also that this is not actually an offer for content but it's kind of like a teaser for new content. And obviously like this game is, is at a point where it has such a huge fan base that they can do that. Um, but it's also interesting to think about content that way. It's like you know, games are not just like the core content, but also sort of the following and the community around it. Um, and to kind of um, you know, build up the excitement for it that way. Um, this part of the presentation is going to be a little bit more about ads and uh, ad monetization, because um, uh, it is a big part for us also of our monetization, where on Google Play, it's even like half of the revenue comes from ads. Um, on iOS, it's a little bit less. Um, but obviously, you don't want to annoy your players with ads, right? You want to find that nice balance where people appreciate it, um, you know, your, your eCPM is still, still high enough, um, and it adds value to your game. Um, so to kind of reach that point, you want to keep players in your game for quite a long time. Uh, we aim for an average session, session length of about 30 minutes. Um, we have a Wheel of Fortune um, element in the game here that can only be spun every 10 minutes. And every five spins, the user gets like another small gem bonus on top of it as an extra reward for doing the Wheel of Fortune. Um, and you know, just there's events like sort of the cookie rush uh, that is not like an ad-based event, but that's an event specifically designed to keep people longer in the game. Because um, if they finish three um, levels in a row you know, without failing, then they get sort of more extra um, uh, starting boosters and starting bonuses for the levels after that. Um, but the effect only lasts for one day. So is as long as people keep playing that day, they get those extra starter boosters. But then if they log off and come back the next day, then those boosters are gone and they need to like start building it up again from scratch. Um, so yeah, that's, that's specifically designed to keep people in the game for those uh, 30 minutes or, or longer. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, you know, by, the, by that way, we kind of, um, designed the game to show five or six ads per user session, um, which is, is quite of a nice average, I think. But because people play for 30 minutes, it, the, 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 the frequency of the ads doesn't become too annoying. It's still kind of a, a nice balance, a nice mix between uh, gameplay and ads. 
Um, yeah, rolling into the point that ads do not lower the quality of your game if you implement them right. Um, it's like as long as they bring value to the player, they're totally okay, and then they're even appreciated. Um, uh, for rewarded uh, ads, that you know, that's that's kind of simple because the user gets something immediately in return for it, being extra moves or gems or a bonus or whatever. Um, but even interstitials can be implemented in a, uh, a non-intrusive, non-annoying way. Um, we typically implement them after the user has finished a level, uh, when they kind of already have that little moment of, yeah. um, and they kind of, you know, they, they, their attention span, uh, their, their attention sort of relaxes a little, sort of, how to, yeah, how to say it. Um, their concentration, I guess what I'm trying to say, that, you know, they're like a little bit more relaxed at that moment. Um, and then we show in them ads, it's it's not like a really annoying moment. Um, we also do not show that ad if the user failed the level, only if they succeeded it and they're like in that sort of good vibe space. Um, plus interstitials are always skippable after five seconds. So, um, you know, even if they absolutely hate ads, it's only a short, short sort of uh, experience for that. Um, and uh, obviously we A-B tested stuff like this. We did not see a drop in session length or user rating or, or anything when we added these placements, um, you know, the rewards and the interstitials. There was, there was not a, a drop in, um, in any of those metrics, um, but it does provide a, a nice additional uh, revenue stream. Um, most of our ad revenue is from rewarded videos. Um, I'd say about 70% of our Ad revenue is from awarded videos, um, but yeah, the other thirty percent from interstitials. That, of course, that's a nice, a nice extra. Um, you know, wouldn't want to sort of miss that. Um, last two points are a little bit more about what the audience expects, um, audience expectations, and um, there's two examples here where. In hindsight, I think we kind of kind of didn't get it all that right um, with, with the art style. Um, so on the uh, left, there's a hidden object game, which was kind of in a cartoony way, cartoony style, um, like um, you know, like sort of cartoon characters and all these um, sort of light and bright hand drawn scenes, and. It doesn't look like a hidden object game in the way that people are used to hidden object games. Um, people are used to sort of these, um, you know, the, the ones that you see all the time on like Big Fish games and all these sort of dark, myster mysterious, detective um, theme things. And, and that's what people sort of came to, to expect from that theme. And then when we, when we put out this sort of light and bright, um, funny uh, cartoon game, um, I mean, it was it was a good game, but I don't think that it kind of hit the right notes in terms of expectations. Um, even though the name literally says like hidden object, but so that's that's kind of um, also one one lesson that we learned that uh, even if you want to sort of um, change the market that way, then you know, don't go too radical about it. Um, and then the uh, image on the right, the farm terrain, um, the the icon of this game was a little bit like the logo that you see here, which probably looked a little bit too much like a kid's game that way. A little bit of too much of a Thomas the Train uh, uh, reference there. Um, the conductor is, um, you know, probably also a little bit too much like a, a kitty cartoon character. The color scheme was a little bit too childish. Um, even though the gameplay in this game was actually quite challenging. You know, it's like this sort of Tetris kind of game where you have to fill the train wagons with all these, uh, these crates of, of fruits and vegetables in, in the right way. Um, and it became quite challenging quite quickly. So that was obviously a mismatch between look and feel and expectations and what the actual gameplay was. Um, so that's, you know, sometimes we just try out new things and just kind of go off the, the, the beaten path, so to say, and, and sometimes that works and uh, sometimes it doesn't, and uh, then you learn. And then point number 10, um, community growth is, you know, when your game gets like popular, that is something that will happen. Um, community will, will exist somewhere. 
the question is just like, will it exist in an environment where you can control it? Or will it be, you know, all over Facebook, Reddit, Discord, uh, whatever. Right? If, if you give people a space in your game to, to interact and to be creative and to participate, um, the sort of the people, the people who want to socialize sort of with the game and in the game, they have that space there to do it. And then the chance is bigger that they actually will stay uh, in the game. Uh, also, again, adding to those minutes of gameplay. Um, so the um, dream home design room contest that I talked about a little bit earlier, you also see a bit of a screenshot of the sort of challenge results and then people can view each other's rooms and kind of you know, see who participated. And uh, there's a little bit of user interaction there. Um, there's tournaments running, which kind of also adds to, to a uh, community feeling. Um, and again, to like throw in a, a screenshot of, of Clash Royale, um, obviously they have sort of their whole um, um, clan system and yeah, like you have your whole sort of uh, friends, friends list in there and, and various ways to, to interact there. Um, so, you know, these are all examples of how to sort of allow space for a community in your game uh, to also kind of keep it in your own game. Um, and if, if something like this is not provided, um, you know, and you, you do have your, your loyal fans, then they will just find a space elsewhere to, to post about it. And then that space is not necessarily in your control. So that's also something to, to kind of um, think about and, and plan for. So those were kind of my uh, 10 basic uh, guidelines. And I think 10 important things to you can keep in mind when you uh, specifically sort of um, you know, for free to play commercial game design. Um, here is a little bit of an overview, and I'm giving you some time to, you know, screenshot for whoever wants to like keep keep that list in. Um, and then uh, I think it is time to go to the second part of uh, of this session, uh, which will be the uh, publisher ask me anything. The ask me anything. We can certainly do that. Let's, let's take this off. Uh, so. That was a great presentation. Thank you. All right, let's get to this comment here from Rich Hutnick. So that's not the right question. <laughs> Difference between a convention and a conference. The conventions have cosplay judging. That's hilarious. All right, so here we go. Here's a real question. Is there an increasing market for virtual escape rooms now? I don't know if it's increasing. Um, I think there's always been games like that. Um, yeah, you know, I started my career sort of the, the flash day, flash games in the industry, uh, you know, flash web games. And I remember from that time, there were also quite a lot of uh, virtual escape room games. Um, and um, actually, a, a lot of sort of the, uh, the, the, the things that I saw there, like the, the, the possible solutions I saw there, I then sort of applied to real room escape games that I've been in, you know. So that was kind of interesting, um, you know. So relevant knowledge. Um, so, and I, I don't think there's an increase, but I think it's a very steady, uh, steady popular genre where you will probably not see a virtual room escape game in like the top grossing top 10 on Google player or, or iOS. Um, but there's definitely always a market for it. Okay, let's see. The next question here is from Mr. J. Powell himself. Actually, this is a carryover question. Uh, what advice would you give to a developer who's trying to get a publisher for their first game? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's more like general advice of, of be prepared. Um, you know, I, I get quite a lot of um, emails from developers who like approach me with their first game ever. Um, and, you know, I'm always happy to help. Definitely. Um, but first of all, uh, it would be you know appreciated if you know who I am and what kind of games I publish, because it's all very, very clearly on the website. Um, so I guess just to show that little like attention to detail and that little care that you actually like looked at my website and know what kind of games we have and possibly even like know my name, um, that that gets you very far because uh, then I, you know, feel treated as a person and then I will treat you as a person and I will like gladly look at your game and provide feedback and help you and, you know, uh, like maybe make introductions to other publishers if I'm not the right fit. 
um, you know, we're, we're all, I think, quite a friendly bunch. Uh, just, uh, you know, as, as long as we can uh, communicate in a nice way. Um, so I guess, you know, that's, that's a solid piece of advice that I like to give. So be personal. Uh, here we, this is from Mr. Kuki. Are there any stats on puzzle games not based on mobile, like PC and console? I'm sure there are. Um, I just don't know many. I don't know many stats of um, non-mobile puzzle games because my my entire business is focused around mobile. Um, so uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm sure that there are very very uh, useful sites and statistics out there, but I wouldn't be able to point you to them. Oh, here's an interesting one. What's the split these days between whales and not whales for mobile casual? Is it still a whale hunting expedition or have things changed over the last de decade? <laughs> things changed a little bit, I'd say. Um, first of all, the definition of a whale is just wildly different. Like, you know, it's, it's a big variable per, per game. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, like Clash Royale, for example, has plenty of users who spend thousands of dollars in that game. Um, I am not that lucky, you know. I, I have quite a, a, a good for the fan base and uh, people who, um, who who spend quite a fair amount of money in the game, but not that much. So my definition of a whale would be completely different from their definition of a whale. Um, but the general trend is that we see that um, there's more. Well, I mean. You can give all these sort of uh, these names to them, but more minnows, you know, more like sort of these people who spend a mid-range amount of money. And, and in my games, a mid-range amount of money would be anywhere between eight and thirty dollars. Um, so that segment of players um, has has been growing. Kind of, that's kind of the overall trend. What I also hear from other publishers. That's interesting. Uh, Mr. Kuki has another one here. When it comes uh, with target demographics. How much does art style come into play? I would say quite a bit. Um, and not just art style, but also the theme. Um, so for example, I just, you know, in in, in all those just times uh, that I published hidden object games, a space hidden object game just never worked. Um, I'm sure that there is a subset of people who would really love to see a hidden object in space but the vast majority of hidden object players are just not interested in that setting. They are far more interested in something that is based on like the Roaring Twenties or Medieval Times or Sherlock Holmes and you know, just, just the kind of themes that are more um, sort of wildly, wildly explored already as well. Um, but yeah, it's just like, you know, that's what people know, what they love and what they go for. Um, and it's it's wonderful if companies are like trying to innovate and uh, do something completely different. Um, but that's always kind of that sort of hard balancing act when you're really trying to make money with the game. Because are you going to do something that is super risky and maybe only for sort of this you know, small hardcore group of um, fans of, of, of that theme? Or are you going to do something that is like, you know, more, more or less... Uh, risk-free and um, yeah, something that is by that way also far less original. Um, so yeah, it's, um, I'm not sure if that answers your, your question, um, but I'd say yeah, art style and theme kind of go hand in hand here. Well, it's kind of like if you are, you know, target demographic as kids, you're not gonna have like skulls and blood and monsters, you know what I mean? Right. It's gonna be like yeah. cutesy and whatever. And exactly, and, and then there's also the fact that even if you would try to do that, then Apple and Google wouldn't even allow you to target that demographic. Because there's always this questionnaire that you need to fill in for the age rating. And then if you say like, oh yeah, there's gore and Nazis in my game, then obviously it's not gonna get like the Peggy three plus rating. All right, let's see here. Oh, here's a good one. Can you talk more about the feel good feeling you mentioned when clicking on offers? Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think it's referring to the in a purchase offers. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of that, um, let me say it, sort of that, that bonus feeling where, I mean, obviously what the payer is, is playing for is, is what they're getting. So they, they kind of already know what they're buying. But um, we kind of sort of try to design the offers in a way that it kind of looks like they are uh, you know, getting more and more treats and more bonuses. Um, 
kind of compare it to the, like when you're in a shop and you see it's like uh, you know three for the price of two. I mean, you know that you're just gonna you know pay that that price that that song very impressed. But but still, it kind of kind of feels like that that third one that you're also getting is is a gift. Um, and it's it's kind of I mean. It's kind of sort of designing that that way that the feed, the, the the player also feels good about about their purchase that they're kind of um, uh, um, that they're kind of discovering this offer at the right moment for that discount that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. So that's that's also why some of the uh, most popular in-app purchases are, are time limited. Because when the player sees that, then they could feel like, oh, I see this exactly at the right moment, and this offer is actually something that I've already been thinking about it for a while and then now is the time to get it it's kind of, it is exciting two for the price yeah. of three and you get your second one for free right? <laughs> right i mean that's not a good deal but okay here we go this uh here's one from indie game business how do you go about picking the ideal icon for the app store testing lots and lots of testing yeah um testing has gotten easier over the years um so, you know, in, in the app stores itself, there's also quite easy ways to A-B test icons. Um, and, you know, then we just like keep um, uh, testing variations to the winner, basically. So, you know, you can kind of see our app icon uh, uh, testing as, as kind of a tree where, you know, we start with this one and then, um, you know, we have two variations and this one does really well. So then we continue with two variations of that one. And then the variations get smaller and smaller. Um, until you basically have sort of the, the, the ideal icon. Um, but then it's also a good point not to sort of get lazy and st stick with that icon forever, because that icon that might sort of work very well for a few months, but then the app store around it and all the icons around it are constantly changing. So it could be that in a couple of months that your ideal icon is not the ideal icon anymore because all the competitors around it changed. Um, so it's, it's important to sort of keep uh, checking your uh, your app store icon every few months and, and see if, you know, keep testing and see if, if it can be better see if it pops out or if it's different or if everyone's copied it or whatever yeah exactly i think everyone remembers that phase where half the app store was just like screaming men uh, in the top 10 facing to the everyone, left or, yeah facing exactly, to the everyone left. was copying what clash of clans did and and it worked somehow that's so funny Okay, here we go. Uh, this is from the Discord. And you were also talking about um, like new levels and content, but we'll go to this question first. For a free-to-play mobile puzzle game, what should be the target length of gameplay at launch? Um, I think at launch, it's really important that it's not too short. Because um, when you first uh, have your players in the game and you know they didn't only install it but they also started playing it because that's like two separate sort of steps to um, in, in the whole process um, that that first session should also ideally be at least 30 minutes it's even better to aim for like 40 45 minutes uh, of like content that they can actually play until they hit sort of this you know this 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 sort of stopper where they run out of energy or run out of gems and they need to wait until it regenerates over time. Because sort of. um, that first session is, you know, that's, that's kind of, um, that's also kind of a decision maker if this game is going to become part of their sort of daily gaming habits. You know, you kind of want to leave the player at that moment where they are interested enough in the game and they have the feeling that they understand the game but they also have the feeling that there is a lot to explore, that they haven't even sort of, you know, uncovered 1% of the entire game yet. Um, so in that first time user experience is also really important to show the user, you know, kind of to show them sort of the tip of the iceberg thing, like, oh, there's all these options and all these things to unlock and uncover and this entire world to explore. Um, but, then, but then start small and not overwhelm the user too much with sort of all the, um, all the different gameplay options. So, you know, I get, um, let the feeler sort of, let the user end with this feeling that they understand this bit of your game, but they also see that there's a lot more to it. Kind um, of like when they just run out of energy, they're like, no! I, yeah, I exactly. Wanted to continue. You know, they, they, they will have this feeling like, oh, I kind of want to return to that game and, and try again and see what else is there. Um, 
And then if they're using it that couple days in a row, then the chances of this game becoming part of their sort of daily gaming routine is a lot larger. Okay, so here's a follow-up to that question. Assuming we release new levels content every two to three weeks, how much additional gameplay length should those amount up to? Um, I guess that like depends a lot on your game design. Um, I mean, if, if your game is just like, you know, let's say like Candy Crush, like it's just a linear path of levels, um, then that should like that amount of content should then be a lot longer than when it is something that involves a lot more um, grind for new options. So for example, new content um, in something like Home Design Blast can also be a new couch for your dream home. Um, and this couch is, is wonderful and it's made out of gold and glitter and unicorns and everyone wants it, but it's also very expensive. So then the user will need to play more levels to save up uh, in-game currency to be able to get it. Um, so that way you, you haven't necessarily released sort of that much extra content, but you have released something sort of desirable that people want to, want to play for. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's hard to answer in that sense that, um, it's not really kind of expressed in an amount of hours of gameplay that sort of it should, uh, should be there. Um, but more kind of like how you design your game and um, how much a user should play sort of every day to, to, to keep interested and kind of you know, how long it will take them to, to reach that goal. Okay, here's another one from the Discord. My very first draft underestimated the cost of my game, and now I believe my current draft might be overestimating it. If I'm only supposed to present one set of numbers, how can I make sure my estimates are good? Yeah, tricky. Um, what what we I mean I'm not sure if this answer is going to help. I hope it does. But what we see with all our development projects, it it's, it always runs over you know sort of over deadline time for about three months or something, um, and then that is until launch. And then after launch, there's typically let's say another two three months after sort of soft launch where. The game is hardly making any revenue, but we are gathering lots of important data and statistics to learn from and then improve the game again. So typically our whole launch launch cycle from, well, I mean, our whole, our whole cycle as a publisher, so from the moment that we start talking to you to first release to actually like, you know, like, okay, now we're confident, now the stats look good, now we go into full release, um, at least six months, you know, usually six to eight months. Um, so when you look at your budgeting, I think it is important to kind of calculate that in as well. Um, so sort of that extra time to make sure you have that runway, because the worst releases we've had were releases where we we kind of released a game that we were half happy with, but we had to release it because the developer was just running out of money. Um, and and that's, I mean. It's, it's kind of never a good situation because then you know you are releasing something that is not the optimal product that it could be. Um, and then the revenue potential is also, again, quite a bit lower. Um, so you, that, that's a situation where you, you don't want to be in. Um, so yeah, that's why it's good to, to budget for that. Okay, well, I don't think anybody else have any questions. We would love to... Uh to if you have a question to pop them in there. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add right now, Martine? And, or, or we can just wrap up, we can go eat lunch. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, it would be dinner for me, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm in the Netherlands, it's, uh, it's 7, 7.45 right now, PM. Um, yeah, no, it's, um, I, I do think the questions that we got were really interesting and it also gives me more of uh, an insight in also what developers are, um, you know, what's on their mind and what they want to know more about. Um, so thank you for all the good questions. And uh, that's also something that I can kind of keep in mind when I'm designing my next talk for perhaps the next virtual conference. Oh, so, here, uh, here we've got a good question. Can I rely on a third party for ASO? You can, um, but it's, you know, it's always sort of a time, time pays for money, money pays for time thing. Um, it's it's something that you also can do on your own if you have a small budget and lots of time. Um, but you know, if you're a game developer and you would like to 
um, focus on developing games, then I guess it's better to let a, a third party do it who have lots of experience with it. Um, just but in in the field of ASO specialists, um, you know, there's 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 quite a lot, and uh, some of them have a better track record than others. Um, so just I'd say just see if you can like find one uh, that has good references, um, you know, one that perhaps a developer you know has worked with and they recommend it. And um, I'd say it's uh, it's definitely a, an interesting service. So what's the short list of the perfect email pitch to you what what needs to be in there so you've got all your information at a glance um a link to a video like a 30 second video um ideally a uh, a playable so just like a dropbox link or a WeTransfer transfer link or whatever to an apk or uh you know if it's already in soft launch just a link to the, the, the google play store or whatever or the uh or a test flight of course um you know, test flight link or code um that and for the rest there doesn't need to be that much else in there you know about the game description uh, just like three to five lines of basic explanation of what it is uh, is already enough um because the gameplay the game will speak oh wait we lost martin Or wait. Whoops. Okay. I was like, technical difficulty. We lost Martine and then we lost yep. Indy's audio. No, technical difficulty. All right. So, I mean, we, we had pretty much wrapped the questions on that anyway. If you do have more questions, uh, Martine is on our, our Discord server. The uh, majority of our speakers for the next three days are. So, hop over there to discord.gg slash indie game business. Uh, you'll have a, a brief period there where you need to, you can't type. So, you know, it keeps the bots out, but then, yeah, you know, absolutely ask it. We've got channel set up for, you know, the AMAs that we're doing this week. We've got an AMA from uh, Anya, who's the director of games at Kickstarter, going to do everything that you ever wanted to possibly know about Discorder. Um, Discorder, Kickstarter. Uh, Just Discord and Kickstarter put together. Exactly. <laughs> Just starter. So uh, Alan Noon from Epic is going to be here giving Ooh. you the lowdown on what you need to set your best foot forward on uh, on Epic Mega Grants. So if you're looking at applying for one of those, you know we're going to do that. Uh, Ed and several of the developers are going to be talking about the how you set up a business that lasts for for years and years and years. And we've got a lot more good content coming. We're only are we a little over halfway through day one at this yeah, point? Yeah, we have one, two, three, four. We have four more. Okay. So the, who we got next? We got Mr. Adam Creighton. The Creighton. Is it Creighton? I mean, it's Adam Creighton. No, it's Adam Creighton. The big win, relationship-driven strategic partnerships. That's what he'll talk about. After that is Chris Sikowski. Three ways to understand your game's audience, which, I mean, if you don't understand your game's audience, then... Uh, then, then we have a panel after that, uh, hiring and retaining diverse leaders, the next generation of games. And then our last panel of the day is the game writing U A U A ask us anything. And there is an amazing group of people there. Toya, Christian Finley, Maurice brought us Michelle Clow, Heidi McDonald, Whitney Bertrand and Andrew Walsh. That'll just be, that'll be, I think that'll be like the most people we've had using this platform. Until later on when we do the uh, the uh, the big one, we're gonna have nine, ten people on here. The showcase of Argentinian games that's gonna be amazing. And but that's tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, we have like four more four more sessions. All right, so Indy and I are gonna take a a quick break, ten minutes. Yeah, we'll be back. Make sure you follow us wherever you are because all these sessions are different. We're not doing one gigantic continuous stream. And mm -hmm. so that way you get notified when the next one pops up. But yeah, for the most part, for the next three days, from roughly 8 a.m. Eastern till 5 or 6 p.m. Eastern, we're doing a session every day. So That means 5 o'clock in the morning, my time. That's what I mean. Yeah, it so. does. Yeah. <laughs> Andy's taking one for the team this week. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will see you soon.